So, good day everybody. Hope all of you are doing fine. So, for this lesson on evolutionary biology, we shall study the geologic time scale. Now, what is this geologic time scale anyway? Now, the geologic time scale basically is a calendar. We can compare this to a calendar that shows major events that occurred in the Earth's history. So, that's our perspective of the geologic time scale. It is the calendar that shows the major events that occurred in the Earth's history. Now, this geologic time scale is divided into three eras. We have the Paleozoic era or Ancient Life era. Then we have the Mesozoic era or Middle Life or sometimes known as the Age of the Reptiles. Then we have the Cenozoic era or Recent Life or the Age of the Mammals. Now, each era is composed further of different periods. So, for the Paleozoic era, we have the following periods. Precambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and the Permian period. For the Mesozoic era, we have here three periods. Under the Mesozoic era, we have the Triassic period the Jurassic period, and the Cretaceous period. Then for the Cenozoic era, we have the following periods, the Tertiary and the Quaternary periods. So at this point, let us now go into the details of the different eras and their respective periods. Starting with the Paleozoic era, the first period under the Paleozoic era is the Precambrian period. Now, during the Precambrian period, we saw the evolution of the first living cell, which are the anaerobic bacteria, prokaryotes. So, these prokaryotes, they have no nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, such as the anaerobic bacteria. And eventually, after millions of years, the first photosynthetic blue-green algae or the cyanobacteria appeared during the Precambrian period. And uh, these anaerobic cyanobacteria, they underwent photosynthesis for the first time because of the development of a new molecule called chlorophyll. So these cyanobacteria, they were able to underwent photosynthesis. They were able to release oxygen for the first time as the byproduct of photosynthesis. So this release of oxygen was crucial because of the formation of the ozone layer. This led to the formation of the ozone layer. The oxygen that was released through photosynthesis steadily strengthened the ozone layer. And we know the ozone layer protects the earth from harmful UV rays from the sun. And this changed the earth's atmosphere. So with this, the earth became more conducive for the evolution of higher life forms. And we have here stromatolites. So these are the fossilized remains of these photosynthetic cyanobacteria. Many fossils of these prokaryotes are found in layers that mix up these prokaryotic mats. So those are the stromatolites. And that's how we visualize the Precambrian period. So to further help you visualize the Precambrian period and the events that occurred during the Precambrian period. Let's watch this short video. <laughs> Alright, let's watch this. Precambrian period literally means before the Cambrian period. This archaic, but still widely used term originally referred to the period of Earth's history preceding the development of the oldest rocks containing recognized fossils. However, Geologists have discovered certain difficult-to-find fossils in some Precambrian strata in recent decades, therefore this period is now known as the Obscure Life or Cryptozoic Eon. The Precambrian period accounts for over 90% of Earth's history. The Hadean, Proterozoic and Archaean eras are the three periods that make up the Precambrian period. The Precambrian era spans the period of geologic time preceding 600 million years ago. 
the Precambrian period was first characterized as the period preceding the development of life in the Cambrian period. However, it is now known that life on Earth began in the early Archaean and that fossilized species grew in abundance during the Precambrian period. Hadean or the Hades-like era was about 4.6 billion years ago. The planet was formed from dust and gas orbiting the Sun. During this time, the Earth's surface resembled famous depictions of hell, oceans of liquid rock, boiling sulfur, and impact craters galore. Volcanoes erupt all over the place, while space debris and asteroids continue to fall down. It's difficult to take a step without falling into a lava pit or being struck by a meteor. The air is dense, sultry, and loaded with dust and grime. However, you can't breathe it because it's made entirely of carbon dioxide and water vapor, with traces of nitrogen and odorous sulfur compounds. Some believe that an asteroid the size of Mars collided with the Earth during the start of the Hadean era, utterly smashing and melting it and forming the Earth's only natural satellite moon as a result of the process. Archaean era is also known as ancient or primitive era. This age begins almost a billion years after the Earth's origin, and things have changed dramatically. Everything has mostly cooled down. The majority of the water vapor in the atmosphere has cooled and condensed, becoming a global ocean. The majority of the carbon dioxide has been chemically converted to limestone and buried at the ocean's bottom. The sky is now filled with typical clouds and rain, and the air is largely nitrogen. To construct the ocean floor, the lava is mostly cooled. As evidenced by the numerous erupting volcanoes, the Earth's interior remains hot and active. The volcanoes form lengthy chains of little islands. The sole terrestrial surface is the islands. The continents have yet to develop. The movement of rock deep within the Earth's interior carries the islands across the surface. The era of the Proterozoic which literally translates to early life was about 700 million years ago, towards the end of geologic history's longest epoch. It started 2 billion years after the world was formed and lasted another 2 billion years. So, what has transpired since then? There is still a lot of land to view. In fact, in this era, we can see two supercontinents, one visible on this side of the equator and the other on the other side. During the Archaean Ages and even most of the Proterozoic Ages, collisions of the many, many islands created by volcanoes built these massive land formations. In fact, geologists use the age of the oldest continental rocks that haven't been warmed or chemically altered to determine the start of the Proterozoic era. Life is only found in the water, roughly around 1.7 billion years ago, as animals which were single-celled with a true nucleus. So I hope that short video had helped you visualize the major events that occurred during the pre-Cambrian period. Alright, let us proceed now to the next period of the Paleozoic era which is the Cambrian period. Now, the Cambrian period can be characterized by the following. Number one, there's no terrestrial life yet. Then we saw the emergence of these invertebrate groups like jellyfish, brachiopods, and protozoa. They dominated the primitive seas of the Cambrian period. There was an explosion of life during the Cambrian period. Macroscopic fossils first appeared, first as shells of calcium carbonate, then as bones of calcium phosphate. And tidobites dominated the Cambrian seas. So there was an explosion of marine life during the Cambrian period. So that's how we visualize the Cambrian period. So this is the fossilized remains of the trilobite. Alright, so to help you visualize further the Cambrian period, let's watch this short video. Alright, let's watch this. The Cambrian period, between 542 and 488 million years ago, was one of rapid plate movement, 
Most of these was an extraordinary explosion in animal diversity. Many of these new forms evolved the ability to biomineralize, this probably occurred in response to the evolution of predators. Soft-bodied animals from this period are preserved in localities such as Canada's Burgess Shale and Chenjiang in China. During this period of sea level rise, continents were inundated, apart from Gondwana, eastern Siberia and Kazakhstan which were mountainous, life proliferated in warm, shallow water marine environments, complex animals with mineralized skeletons evolved, such as sponges, corals and arthropods, changes in ocean chemistry, greater diversity of plankton species at the base of the food chain, and pressure from predators may all have contributed to the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian has a high global temperatures, one estimate suggests that by the late Cambrian these averaged 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, many low-lying continents experienced arid conditions produced by wind blowing from the land and low rainfall, few indicators for hot, humid climates have been found in the Cambrian geological record, although there are examples in Laurentia of laterite and bauxite, known to form in the tropics in these conditions, with no continents located directly over the poles, and oceans covering a larger part of the globe, the climate is likely to have been relativity equitable overall. The beginning of the Cambrian witnessed an incredible event in evolution. In just a few million years animal groups, from worms to fishes, appeared. Microscopic remains of these creatures have been remarkably well preserved. These small, shelly fossils are evidence of this avalanche of evolution. Before the Cambrian, most animals lacked either jaws or a through gut, which meant they had no anus. The evolution of chewing, and then of predation, started an arms race that rapidly transformed ecosystems around the world. Among the first tooth-like elements to appear were those of Protorzina, belonging to a creature similar to a modern arrow worm, external skeleton. S quickly evolved for protection, the tiny, cap-shaped shells of Myconella, for example, were made from clusters of spines called sclerites. Later, other animals, such as brachiopods, merged their sclerites to form a single, solid shell. Fossils of soft tissues, including the cyanobacteria and other algae, can be found in Cambrian phosphates, but after the Cambrian, such remarkable preservation became rare, possibly because more scavenging was taking place on the seafloor. A multitude of new, small organisms, collectively known as plankton, began to drift freely through the Cambrian seas and oceans, transforming the food chain. The great oceans provided a valuable means of dispersal, as well as a degree of protection from grazers and predators. Radiolarian zooplankton, with their delicate silica skeletons, appeared and fed on other small, drifting organisms. These zooplankton began to form the biological silica deposits called radiolarian cherts, Diverse types of phytoplankton also thrived, using sunlight to make their own food by means of photosynthesis. Many secreted a protective armor called resting cysts and fell to the seafloor, where they were readily preserved. All of these creatures provided an abundant supply of food for the new types of animals that appeared during the Cambrian explosion. This microfossil appears near the base of Cambrian rocks. Each tooth-like protoconodont is made of calcium phosphate, and has a hollow basal portion for attachment. It is shield-shaped in cross-section and has a long, curved spine. Occasionally, protorzina are found in clusters that closely resemble the portcullis-like jaws of modern arrowworms. This suggests that this was an early predator. This cap-shaped fossil had weakly mineralized shell that was phosphatized after its death. The pineapple-like shell was made from tightly packed spines called sclerites. At first these sclerites were not strongly fused together. Sometimes they are found separately. After several million years of evolution, the spines became more strongly fused into a single, rigid shell that was similar in shape to a modern limpet. In Greenland, examples have been found where the slug-like owner had been carrying two myconella-like caps, surrounded by a skirt of siphogonocytes like sclerites. This complex arrangement is a reminder that much experimentation was still taking place at this time. Myconella probably grazed on algae that grew on the Cambrian seafloor. This tubular fossil had a calcareous shell made of aragonite. In cross-section it is a distinctive trilobed, cloverleaf shape. 
Like many small, shelly fossils from the early Cambrian, its biological affinities remain uncertain, but it could have been close to the Cnidarian groups of jellyfish and corals. It may have lived in colonies, embedded in the sediment, and feeding on organic matter in the water column. Modern-looking mollusk shells evolved with surprising rapidity during the course of the early Cambrian period. This resulted in coiled forms, such as the one shown here, which appeared across a wide area from Canada to China. It occurred alongside other mollusks that crudely resemble much younger bivalves and even coiled cephalopods. Although little Aldonella looks similar to a modern garden snail, there is no evidence that it was closely related to Gasteropoda. It probable grazed on detritus near the surface of the Cambrian seafloor. The Cambrian was a critical time in evolutionary history because diverse marine invertebrates began to appear. Some had eyes and strong jaws that enabled them to live as the first active predators. Other Cambrian evolutionary fauna, such as trilobites, flourished, but declined from the Ordovician onward. The Cambrian explosion was the first truly significant evolutionary event in the history of life, heralding the origin and proliferation of hard-shelled marine invertebrates. First, following the extinction of the Ediacaran fauna about 543 million years ago, came the small, shelly fossils, which are represented by phosphatic horns and coils, plates and tubes. These persisted until around 525 million years ago, when the first trilobites, inarticulate brachiopods and other hard-shelled fossils started to appear. But these represent a mere fraction of the vast diversity of Cambrian life. Archaeocyathids We re the first reef-building organisms, they were confined to tropical areas and were only in existence for a relatively short period, but they diversified rapidly during this time. Some forms were solitary, while others were colonial. They were made up of two calcite cones, arranged one inside the other with a space between them. The cones were held apart by calcitic septa that crossed the space, the outer cone attached to the seabed by a root-like structure at its base. Atoya is one of the fossils found in Canada's Burgess Shale that can be associated with a living animal group, the marine priapulid worms. Atoya is the most common Burgess Shale priapulid worm, with around 1500 known specimens. It gathered food with a tube-like organ called a proboscis, which was equipped with spiny hooks and could be turned inside out. Many fossilized specimens have a strongly curved body, which has led to suggestions that, like its modern counterparts, Atoya lived in a U-shaped burrow and extended its proboscis to catch prey. Several specimens have been found with their gut contents intact, which include small, shelly hyolithids and even members of their own species, which may indicate that Atoya was cannibalistic. Ecmatochronus is an unusual fossil, found only in the Burgess Shale Formation in Canada, the surface of its long, conical body was covered with thin, polygonal plates or scales that were arranged irregularly. There were seven to nine plated arms or tentacles that were attached to the top of the body. Long, thin, non-mineralized branches occurred on alternate sides of these arms. Ecmatochronus has been difficult to classify. When it was first described it was thought to be a crinoid, but the absence of distinctive echinoderm features, such as five-fold symmetry, has led to other interpretations. Some paleontologists suggest it could actually be an octocoral. Lingalella was an inarticulate brachiopod, meaning that it used muscles to hold its valves in place, rather than teeth or sockets. It was attached to the substrate by a fleshy stalk that emerged from an opening in its pedicle valve. Lingalella's shell was elongated and the beak area was pointed. The surface of the shell had fine. Growth lines and fossils show delicate radial striation on the inner layers. Bohemiella was an orthid brachiopoda group of articulate brachiopods that lived throughout the Paleozoic era. Its valves were elongated in a crossways direction. The pedicle valve was less concave than the brachial valve, or sometimes almost flat. There was a small pair of teeth on the pedicle valve and corresponding sockets in the brachial valve. These had long projections on their inside edges to hold the teeth in position. 
Wewaxia was a striking animal with a body that was symmetrical about its length elliptical viewed from the top and squarish in cross section its upper surface was covered with overlapping rows of protective armor like plates called sclerites and two rows of long spines its lower surface lacked any form of protection Wewaxia's mouth contained a food gathering apparatus with two or three rows of rear facing conical teeth these were probably used for scraping algae or bacteria from the seabed or for collecting food particles from the surrounding water because of the similarities between this apparatus and the redula of mollusks it is thought that Wewaxia may be related to mollusks an alternative hypothesis suggests that it is related to worms. Early Cambrian bivalves are not only very rare only two genera are known but also very small Pohedaia is currently the oldest bivalve ever discovered its shell was almost circular with well-defined beaks on each valve and a straight hinge line the outside of the shell had growth increments and some faint radial ribs internally shell had two adductor muscles that opened and closed the valves the hinge had five or six teeth and sockets in each valve helped the valves align. Helicoplicus was a bizarre echinoderm that represents a very early and ultimately unsuccessful body plan unlike other echinoderms it lacked radial symmetry of any kind tiny plates were arranged spirally around its shell which in its resting state was pear-shaped in fossils the shell plates are usually found separated suggesting that they were not fused together instead the body had the capacity to expand and contract. Greater than and during expansion the plate separated. When Hallucigenia was first studied in the 1970s, reconstructions showed the animal walking on rigid, stilt-like, paired limbs, with a single row of fleshy projections along the top of its back. Nothing of its kind had ever been found before. However, later discoveries showed that earlier reconstructions had, in fact, turned the organism upside down. Hallucigenia had an elongated body, with a rounded head at one end, and a long, fleshy tail. It had seven pairs of stiff, pointed spines along the upper side of its body, along with a cluster of small projections, situated close to its rear end. Opabenia is one of the strangest animals to have been found in Canada's Burgess Shale fossil bed. Unlike any other, its head had five prominent eyes, two sets of pairs, and one eye that was central, Extending from the front of its head was a long, flexible, trunk-like feature, or proboscis, which ended in a pod-shaped organ bearing small spines that were probably used to grasp prey. Opabenia would have used its proboscis to pass its prey up to its mouth. Its elongated body was composed of 16 segments, each of which possessed a flap-like lateral lobe with gills on the underside. Its tail had three flaps that projected from either side. Marella is the most abundant Burgess shale fossil, with over 15,000 known specimens. Curiously, this Canadian site is the only place it has been found in the world. Marella was given the informal name lace crab by the American paleontologist Charles Walcott due to its feathery appearance. It had two distinctive pairs of large, backward-facing spines, one pair running alongside the body, the other, above it. Two pairs of antennae arose from the front of its body, one very long, the other shorter and stouter. The body was composed of 20 segments, each of which had pairs of identical limbs suggest that it was a primitive arthropod. Marilla is thought to have swum along the seabed or just above it, feeding on tiny particles of organic material. Its jointed legs contained feathery gill branches that formed part of its respiratory system. The teeth-like projections on the inner pair of spines are evident in this illustration. Olenellus was a trilobite with a semicircular head shield and a tapering glabella with four pairs of backward pointing furrows. Its eyes were crescent shaped, and their front ends merged with the glabella's frontal lobe. Its thorax had 18 segments, and the third was wider and longer than the others, and ended in a spine. One of the earliest trilobites in the geological record, Olenellus was a key fossil used by Canadian geologist Tuzo Wilson to show that there was once a proto-Atlantic ocean that separated much of continental North America and Western Europe. Paradoxides was one of the largest known genera of trilobites, and it was probably a predator, high in the sea. Ambrian food chain, underneath the widest part of the glabella lay the hypostome, a large, plate-like structure supporting the stomach, whose size and shape suggests predatory activity. Okay. 
Olenus is a trilobite fossil commonly found in dark mudstones, which were deposited on the seafloor in environments with low oxygen levels. It had up to 15 thoracic segments, with very wide pleural or side lobes. These are thought to have supported extended gills, which would have helped the animal absorb the maximum amount of oxygen possible in such an environment. Evidence also suggests that Olenus and its relatives may have developed a symbiotic relationship with sulfur bacteria, either by feeding on them directly, or by absorbing nutrients directly from them. This trilobite fossil is commonly found in large clusters in Cambrian rocks in the Prague district of the Czech Republic. Many specimens are complete but lack free cheeks, which suggests that they were molts, and that the animals congregated to shed their old exoskeletons in order to grow in size. Ellipsocephalus had a prominent, smooth glabella with slightly concave sides, like Olenus its eyes were small and crescent-shaped, the border of the headshield was narrow, defined by a rather narrow, shallow furrow. Elrathia is one of the best-known trilobites in North America, its headshield was semicircular, with a short, conical glabella and two pairs of short, shallow furrows, the crescent-shaped eyes were set some distance from the glabella, near the front, there were 13 segments in its thorax, and its tail shield was much smaller than its head. Tomagnostis is one of many agnostoid trilobites with an almost global distribution, and is thus valuable in correlating Cambrian rocks across wide areas. It probably lived in the open ocean, but it occurs as a fossil in association with more local trilobites in different regions. Anastoids were highly specialized and distinctive members of the trilobite group. Anomalocaris was the largest animal in the Cambrian ecosystem that became fossilized in what is now the Burgess Shale in British Columbia. The animal's head had two eyes, in front of which was a pair of segmented, downward curving appendages, each of the S. Eggments of these appendages had a pair of spiny projections on its underside. Anomalocaris's mouth was situated on the underside of the head, and consisted of a circle of elongated plates. Behind each eye were three small flaps. The body was divided into eight segments, each of which had side flaps, and the maul tail featured an upturned fan of flaps. Fragments of Anomalocaris were originally thought to belong to separate animals. The front appendages were interpreted as the segmented abdomen of a shrimp-like crustacean, while the circular mouthparts were thought to be a jellyfish. Although it was probably not the swiftest of swimmers, many scientists believe that Anomalocaris was at the top of the food chain in the Cambrian seas. Its large size, of up to one meter or more in length, and its formidable circular mouthparts allowed it to capture smaller prey, such as trilobites, with ease. The early Cambrian was a crucial period in the history of life on Earth. Witnessing an explosion in animal diversity, about 540 million years ago the seas were home to the first wave of new animal groups, some of which would eventually die out, but others would lead to the evolution of the first vertebrates. The start of the Cambrian is marked by the appearance of a vast array of animal forms in marine sedimentary rocks that are unknown in older rocks. This explosion in diversity saw the arrival of most of the major groups of animals' body plans. They included the first chordates. Animals that at some point in their life cycle possess a notochord, the precursor of a backbone, and the first vertebrates. Vertebrates are a group of animals that possess a backbone, which surrounds the notochord and provides support for the body. They also have a skull that encloses the brain, eyes, olfactory organs and internal ears. Another important characteristic of vertebrates is that parts of the head, gill arches, and nerves form from neural crest cells. These cells migrate from the nerve cord early in the development of the embryo and travel to different parts of the animal to form these structures. Other vertebrate features include the nervous control of the heart, a set of muscles to control eye movement, at least two semicircular canals in the inner ear, and a lateral line system running along the head and body that has sensory organs called neuromasts. All extinct jawless fish are vertebrates. Of the two living groups, lampreys are considered to be vertebrates, but many authorities exclude hagfish do have a cranium. A marine animal that lived about 530 million years ago, Pichia is one of the earliest known chordates, and belongs to the subphylum cephalochordate. 
in appearance, Picia is similar to the modern lancelet, differing only in having a pair of antenna-like structures on its head. Picia was small and delicate, with a dorsal nerve cord running from front to back under which lay the supporting notochord. V-shaped muscles ran along the sides of its flattened body. A narrow fin membrane extended down the rear two-thirds of the body, broadening into a single tail fin that tapered to a point. The oldest vertebrates by about 30 million years, Millicunmingia and Hycauathus were tiny, jawless, marine fish. Millicunmingia was similar in form to Hycauathus but less slender. It had a distinct head, and its body had backward-facing, V-shaped muscle blocks. However, it differed from Hycauathus in having pouch-like structures associated with its five or six gills. Millicunmingia fossils suggest that it had a cartilaginous skull and some primitive vertebral elements. Some parts of the digestive system are preserved, but not the mouth, and no tail parts have been found. It had a triangular dorsal fin that inclined gently upward a short distance behind the head. Farther back, on the underside of the body, were fin folds. Hycauathus is thought to be one of the most primitive fish without jaws. Preserved in the 530 million years old marine sediments of Chengjiang, it is unlike any other agnathan. It had a rounded extension to the head which bore sensory organs. The eyes, and possibly nasal sacs and otic capsules associated with hearing, on the sides of its body, it had at least six, and possibly up to nine, gill slits supported by gill bars. V-shaped muscle blocks are also visible in places. Hycauathus had a notochord but there is also evidence of vertebrate-like elements, similar to those seen in modern lampreys. So I hope that video had helped you visualize further the major events that occurred during the Cambrian period. Alright, so our next period under the Paleozoic era is the Ordovician period. Now the Ordovician period can be characterized as follows. So we have the emergence of the first fish such as the armored ostracoderm fishes. Then we have the dominance by a diversity of invertebrates. So the diversity of these marine invertebrates continued during the Ordovician period. And also during the Ordovician period, we saw the first recorded mass extinction, destroying about 75% of animal species. Again, this is due to tectonic movement of the land masses. And that result to the extinction of about 75% of life on Earth. And also, trilobites, corals, and members of Phylomollusca continued to flourish during the Ordovician period. Alright, let's watch this short video to help you visualize further the major event that occurred during the Ordovician period and the cause of that first mass extinction. Let's watch this. When we last left off in the Tour Through Time series, we had explored the period known as the Cambrian and the origin of life as we know it. Now, today, we will be moving forward to the next time period known as the Ordovician period. Beginning around 488 million years ago and ending around 443 million years ago, this period in the Earth's history lasted around 45 million years in total. The beginning of the Cambrian period is often called the Cambrian Explosion due to the incredibly rapid increase of life, plants, animals, algae, etc. Comparably, the beginning of the Ordovician period is often known as the Great Ordovician Biodiversity Event. Not quite as catchy as Cambrian Explosion, but the two events are thought of as being two of the most monumental and influential evolutionary events of all time. The Cambrian introduced animal life to oceans and the beginning of the Ordovician ran with it, creating more complex creatures and ecosystems and longer food chains, and life began to flourish and spread quickly. 
The air was filled with carbon dioxide, and the world heated up, making the sea levels rise to almost 2,000 feet higher than what they are today. Shallow oceans covered much of the supercontinent Gondwana, though the land itself was still mostly dry, barren, and lifeless. The oceans, however, were another story entirely. Shallow parts of the ocean were inhabited by corals, sponges, algae, and bryzoans, these guys. Squid relatives, such as the nautiloids, began to show up, dominating the waters as some of the most fearsome and efficient predators of the time. The Ordovician also heralded the rise of the fish, some of the very first true vertebrates. These early fish were jawless and used their mouths to suck up and sift through sand near the seabeds, finding food in the sand. They were also adorned with bony head shields, primitive versions of the armor that would come to define the ancient bony fish. Oh, you know what that sound means. It's time to check on our old pals, the trilobites. Business is booming for our little pals. Originating in the Cambrian period, the trilobites are more diverse and widespread than they'll ever be. The Ordovician trilobites are mostly relegated to the shallow oceans and prefer to stay near the reefs and shores. They have also begun to develop the ability to roll up like an adorable little ball to protect themselves from predators. Although the animals are very successful now, they are about to take a big hit from the Ordovician Silurian mass extinction, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. The Ordovician also introduced the world to these creatures, the nautiloids. These squid-like cephalopods are known by their long, thin, conical shells that grew on their backs, the shells growing along with them as they got older. Some genera, such as the Camaroceras, could grow up to 20 feet long and were equipped with an array of almost a hundred tentacles which it would use to catch unsuspecting prey, such as trilobites, and move them into its beak-like mouth. But the real kicker in this video, the moment you've all been waiting for and one of the most instrumental developments in all of Earth's history is this, the proliferation of life onto the land. Arthropods, the group that includes insects, scorpions, trilobites, among others, began moving into lagoons and more shallow, freshwater environments, slowly but surely inching closer and closer to land. But the first life on land wasn't an animal at all. The winner of the race to land was the plant kingdom. Plants, like sporophytes, made the leap to solid ground, discovering a whole new frontier of life. And while there's not a lot of evidence for animals on land at this time, there have been what may be fossilized burrows of millipede-like animals found from this time period. More research needs to be done, but you may be hearing about that very soon. Of course, life would have made it onto land a lot sooner if it weren't for a teeny little problem that is, one of the biggest extinction events of all time. Gondwana, the supercontinent, moved down south during this period, moving the continental shelves and the habitats that come with them, before finally coming to rest near the South Pole at the end of the Ordovician period. This had a significant effect on the environment and may have been one of the reasons for the second greatest disaster in Earth's history, the Ordovician extinction. We aren't sure what exactly caused this major extinction event, but there have been theories. One of the most probable has to do with the rapid cooling of the Earth, paired with Gondwana's new position at the South Pole. We have evidence that the immense amounts of CO2 in the air and the resulting warm greenhouse effect were beginning to dwindle, cooling the planet down by quite a lot. As this was happening and Gondwana drifted south into colder climates, ice caps and glaciers began to cover the supercontinent. Glaciers lock up seawater and ice, and the result is the sea levels dropping dramatically, exposing reefs, leaving ecosystems high and dry, and stripping animals of their homes. This change was so swift and so major that it may have been the cause of an entire extinction event. Other theories include gamma ray bursts, that is, bursts from stars that would have weakened Earth's atmosphere, allowing deadly rays from the sun to scorch the planet, or large amounts of volcano activity. Whatever the cause, this event resulted in nearly 85% of all life on Earth being destroyed in a comparatively small amount of time, around 25 million years. This is just one of the many mass extinction events that has plagued the planet from the dawn of time. The truth is, life is fragile, but endings like this 
events often lead to new beginnings, and the next episode of Tour Through Time will be looking at the Silurian period and how life kept on going after the first massive extinction. So I hope that video had helped you visualize further the major event that occurred during the Ordovician period and the cause of that mass extinction, killing about 75% of life on Earth. Alright, so let us proceed now to the next period of the Paleozoic Era which is the Silurian period. Now, the Silurian period can be characterized by the following. First, we have the first traces of land life as plants and animals. Then we have the first waxy coated algae that started to colonize the land. So waxy coated algae begin to live on the land. And we have the emergence of the lungfish with jaws, coral, and land plants including scale trees and ferns that reproduce by spores. And the first two terrestrial animals appeared during the Silurian period. We have the millipedes. The millipedes emerge as one of the first true land animals. Then we have the first insects that appeared. Lobe fin fish, jawed fish evolved during the Silurian period. Alright, so to further help you visualize again the major events that occurred during the Silurian period, let's watch this video. So let's watch this. The Silurian period occurred from 443.8 million to 419.2 million years ago. It was the Paleozoic era's third phase. The Silurian was named by Murchison in 1839 for the Silures, a tribe of the Welch borderland. It came after the Ordovician era and before the Devonian era. Continental land masses were low at the time and sea levels were rising. This resulted in a plethora of novel biological niches in shallow water habitats. Silurian fossils reveal significant reef construction and the earliest traces of life colonizing new estuaries, freshwater habitats, and terrestrial environments. Gondwana, the supercontinent, had moved southward and covered the majority of southern latitudes. The northern half of the world was mostly water, with two tiny continents near the equator, Laurentia, and Baltica. Avalonia, another microcontinent, rifted off Gondwana's northern margin and drifted northward. The three northern continents clashed beginning in the late Ordovician and continued through the Silurian and into the Devonian, establishing the new supercontinent, Euramerica. The Caledonian Orogeny, a massive mountain building event, came from this collision. The hills and mountains of Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and the northern Appalachians, as well as the mountains of Sweden and Norway, are remains of this event. Talking about the marine life of the era, in the waters, the comeback was quick, since rising temperatures and sea levels mimic the shallow, marine ecosystems of the past. Huge reef systems thrived in the clear, tropical oceans, as evidenced by the numerous limestone rock formations that date from this time. Corals and prehistoric sponges known as stromatoproids joined previous reef builders such as bryozoans to construct a hard outer skeleton. They only ate minuscule organisms ensnared in their stinging tentacles to stay alive. Oceans abounding with microscopic planktonic animals aided the growth of corals and other marine life. The terrifying eurypterids, or sea scorpions, were waiting at the opposite end of the food chain. Some species reached lengths of more than 6 feet, 2 meters, and are regarded as the world's biggest arthropods. Eurypterids possessed a pair of enormous, complex eyes for looking for primitive fish, which they caught with their formidable claw-like pincers, similar to their scorpion ancestors. Flora and fauna on land also started to develop. On land, creepy crawlies began to appear. They started off little, measuring only a few millimeters in length. Arthropods such as early centipedes and arachnids, the progenitors of spiders, were among the first terrestrial pioneers. Some 430 million years ago, the first real plants began to take root on land. They developed hard stems, which allowed them to stand erect, 
as well as tubular tissues, which are found in all vascular plants and allow water and nutrients to be transported. Although these early immigrants lacked leaves, mosses and other plants soon followed, producing a thin covering of waterside vegetation that encouraged additional aquatic species to migrate to land. Possible rocks of Silurian age are found in what has in the past been called the Ellis Formation. This has been discovered in many sites along the Batten and Skeet rivers, together with Devonian rocks. It's made up of quartzose, sandstones, and siltstones containing uncommon fossils like trilobites. Its age, on the other hand, is unknown. It sits under and grades into mudstones of the Batten Formation in the Batten River, which are clearly Devonian in age. Throughout the Silurian, the climate remained warm and steady. The Gondwana supercontinent remained positioned above the South Pole, although the late Ordovician ice caps had melted almost completely. The temperature of tropical waters may have generated intense storms, according to sediments formed from large amounts of shattered shells. Earth's continents fused together during the Silurian era, sealing the Iapetus Ocean and producing two supercontinents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana land in the south. The Gondwana plates of South America and Southern Africa migrated slowly toward and then over the South Pole. During this period, the northern continents began to converge and form Laurasia. As the continent warmed, glaciers declined and virtually vanished. Warm shallow oceans covered much of the tropical landmass. During the period, there were significant global sea level shifts and oceanic turnovers, meaning exchanges of bottom and surface waters, resulting in a moderate number of extinctions. The Silurian period concluded with a succession of small extinctions caused by such climatic change. Alright, so I hope that video had helped you visualize further the major events that occurred during the Silurian period. Alright, so let us now proceed to the next period of the Paleozoic Era which is the Devonian period. Now, the Devonian period can be characterized as follows. So we have a great variety of fish species that are represented in the fossil record. So the Devonian period because of this diversity of fish species the Devonian period can be characterized as the age of the fishes. Then we have the emergence of the first amphibians such as the Ichthyostega evolved. Then we have terrestrial life which becoming more abundant and diverse. Springtails are among the first land insects that evolved. And there was a second mass extinction event that occurred at the end of the Devonian period, killing most of the fish. Alright, so that's how we characterize the uh, Devonian period, the so-called age of the fishes. And we have here the emergence of the amphibians from the fish species. So let's watch this video about the evolution of the amphibians from the fishes. So let's watch this video. Following the recovery from the Ordovician mass extinction, we started to see our world develop a lot of ecosystems that at least loosely resembled some of what we see today. In the seas, complex food webs of arthropods and fish were starting to thrive. And on land, we were starting to see something akin to the very first forests. But instead of trees, the tallest organisms were strange forms of fungus that evolved into 8 meter tall pillars and the true plants remaining closer to the forest floor. The relatively stable climate of the Silurian allowed life the chance to bounce back. But by the beginning of the Devonian, competition was about to pick up all culminating into the first really big evolutionary arms race. On one side, we had the arthropods, who had dominated most marine ecosystems since the Cambrian explosion. And on the other was the early vertebrates, who had been at a bit of a disadvantage without armored bodies that came in the form of exoskeletons. But ever since the evolution of Jaws, our ancestors were at least able to fight back. And around 419 million years ago, as the Silurian ended and the Devonian began, a surprising thing started to happen. We were about to start winning. 
because at least one group of fish were starting to become every bit as defensive as the arthropods. And this would also give them the tools that they needed to become the apex predators in this increasingly bountiful world. I cannot help you, but you know what can help you? A fish with a guillotine for a face. How is this better? Huh, you may have a point. Maybe we should come up with a new strategy to get through this period. But we have a ton to get into before we even get into that. So let's dive into the Devonian. As I stated in the last episode, the Silurian was a pretty stable time in geologic and climactic terms. During the Devonian, Gondwana would remain as the largest landmass on the planet. Over the 61 million years, it would start to move slightly northwestward, but still remaining entirely in the southern hemisphere. But several smaller landmasses had broken off of both Gondwana and Euroamerica and kind of formed a closed off seaway from the massive Panthalassic Ocean. We call it the Paleotethys Sea, and it, along with the, a narrow seaway called the Ryake Ocean, would become the stage of a lot of noteworthy things that were about to start happening during this time. As far as the climate goes, the Devonian continued in a relatively warm trend, but there was a little more fluctuation than before. There probably was no ice at the poles, but because there was no ice, sea levels were very high leading to an abundance of warm, shallow marine habitats. This was something that had been slowly building up for a while, but with more and more shallow seas opening up, more different kinds of organisms can move in and adapt. In general, shallow seas are comparatively more productive than deep oceans because sunlight has an easier time penetrating shallow water. This allows photosynthetic organisms to spread, which makes up the base of any food web. We saw all that get started in the Silurian, but now after so long with such stable conditions, many different groups were going to start struggling for dominance. And the ones that make the cut would be the ones that learned to take advantage of the new biomes that were becoming available. Today, coral reefs support countless different species of animals. They're basically the marine equivalent of tropical rainforests in terms of biodiversity. And corals have existed in some form ever since the Cambrian explosion. But they weren't building up the giant, calcified structures that we would think of today. At least not yet. The thing about corals is, they've always been really picky about things like ocean temperature and oxygen level and all that. And throughout the Silurian and going into the Devonian, the water temperature was too warm for corals to spread into full-blown reefs. But there was another organism capable of forming reefs during this time. The very same things that have stuck around ever since the Archean. The cyanobacteria. Ever since that now distant time, some species of goo had formed colonies and built up over time into structures called stromatolites. These would become the basis for some of the very first reefs, and likely had been an ecosystem that benefited life for millions of years. But as we get into the Middle Devonian, the climate and ocean temperatures would drop slightly. Now it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to make a big difference for the rugose corals that were around at the time. Because even though corals are picky, once conditions are favorable, they spread much faster than the cyanobacteria can form stromatolites. So by the Middle Devonian, we see a shift to the first large coral reefs that have been on Earth since they were largely wiped out by the Ordovician extinction. These reefs were populated by many creatures that we would consider familiar at this point in our journey as well as a few new faces. The trilobites had fully recovered from their hit that they took at the end of the Ordovician as well, covering the sea floor like the invincible little troopers they are. But in the open water column, a new group of animals was going to appear that was one day going to become an even more common piece of the fossil record than the indestructible pill bugs. And it would be coming from a group that famously doesn't fossilize very well. This is when the very first ammonites appeared. Ammonites are cephalopods. So these guys were distant descendants of the monstrous carrot krakens that ruled during the Ordovician. They were still carnivorous like all other cephalopods, but it seems like the title of apex predator was not within their reach. 
especially when you consider how much competition for that title was started to ramp up. Throughout the entire Solorian period, one group of animals was king. The Eurypterids were still going strong by the beginning of the Devonian, and environmentally, there didn't seem to be very much to keep them down. But despite this, we do see a steep drop-off in the sea scorpion populations at this time. Scientists believe that this is because of new competition that would raise the stakes in the world's oceans. Up until now, jawless fish were the most common fish on Earth. But the vertebrates did manage to branch off into a couple different variations leading up into the Devonian. And that was all laying the groundwork for what was to come. It was now time for two groups to rise up and dethrone the arthropods. This is when the fish with skeletons comprised of flexible cartilage started to become more active predators. The very earliest sharks or cladodonts. And you would think that the first appearance of sharks would be a pretty big deal for marine ecosystems. But really, they were kind of playing second fiddle to the real monsters of this time. The second group of fish to rise up. The ones with bony armor on the outside. This group is called the Placoderms, and they are unlike any fish that we have today. They had jaws, but technically no teeth, at least not in the same sense as you would think. Instead, the armored plates that made up the skulls formed a blade-like structure sort of similar to a beak. And with these tools and defenses, this group of fish didn't just break out as top predators. They started to explode into every possible niche they could. Even the smaller species were so defensive that the only things that could effectively feed on them were bigger placoderms. And that brings me to the thing that I know y'all wanted me to talk about. The biggest and baddest of the placoderms, Dunkleosteus. This nearly 9 meter, 4 ton monster was as far as we know the biggest organism that has existed up until this point. And there is no question that this was an apex predator. Its bite force was focused into the fang tips at the front of the jaw, measuring up to... 80,000 PSI? I... I actually had to double check this. For context, the maximum estimated bite force of a Nile crocodile is around 5,000 PSI. So this thing could bite 16 times harder than a, a large crocodile. And it basically had a guillotine in its mouth. With this thing at the top of the food chain, there really is no wonder why there was a sudden turn to more defensive forms. Arthropods were armored like the placoderms, but the way these new fish predators were armored in the front with powerful muscled tails in the back and a flexible spine, they were doing everything we had seen in other parts of the animal kingdom only better. And since predators drive the evolution of prey by removing the individuals who don't cut it, from the population, everything else on Earth was starting to evolve into the Placoderm's world. The Stylonuria sea scorpions would manage to hold on by not competing directly. But unfortunately, the Eurypterina sea scorpions were just going to fall victim to this power shift. It seems like if you couldn't keep up, the best survival strategy was to get away and avoid the armored fish at all cost. And it would be this pressure that drives one of the most momentous events in the history of life on Earth. One small step for fish. One giant leap for vertebrate kind. With life in the oceans becoming so dangerous, it's not surprising to think that if there was an alternative available, some organisms were going to go for it. And meanwhile on land, as more complex rooted plants started to evolve, this allowed soils to stabilize for the first time, and the plants started to grow larger. This would change the dynamic of terrestrial ecosystems forever. Previously in the Silurian, the giant fungus, like Prototaxtides, were the largest things on land. But as the Devonian went on, they started to slowly get replaced by the very first large plants. It's unknown exactly why the fungal trees were failing while large plants were managing to survive. But one theory is that plants were better equipped to defend against being preyed on by arthropods which there was starting to become a considerable variety. 
Things like centipedes and millipedes were common, and the arachnids like true scorpions, mites, and a strange group that looked like a cross between a tick or a mite and a spider called the trigonotarbids had begun to diversify. Throughout the Silurian, the invertebrates were left unchallenged on the land, but now it was time for that to change. As the plants spread across the land even far away from waterways, along the coast, you would find the very first vertebrates making the leap onto land, the tetrapods. I has feet. They evolved from the lobe-finned fish that, to be honest, were struggling just as much to deal with the armored fish as, well, everything else. But this would give them the chance to survive. Now, this might seem like very humble beginnings, and, well, it is. These things were basically something between a salamander and a mudskipper. But their success is undeniable. Different species started popping up all over the Devonian world. Using their limbs that were still something in between fins and feet, which in different species like Tiktaalik and Archaeostega had eight digits on each, they were able to haul themselves up out of the reach of the placoderms. And in this new world, they would likely become predators. With eyes positioned on the top of their heads and sharp needle-like teeth, it's thought that they were the very first animals to make use of the ambush hunting at the water's edge strategy that we would see many times in the future. These animals are a big deal to our understanding of life because every single organism that lives today and has a backbone and lives on land can trace their ancestry to the pioneering creatures of this time. Although they were still tied to the water, especially to reproduce, this was the blueprint of things to come. And it was lucky that we made this leap when we did. Because as we come to the end of the Devonian, the world's oceans were about to hit hard times once again. The late Devonian extinction is not very well understood. A few things we can say, however, is one, it doesn't appear to have been a single event, but rather multiple events that caused it. And two, the effects were much more severe in the oceans than on land or in freshwater ecosystems. One theory is that an asteroid impact may have been to blame for part of it, but to many scientists this doesn't really check out. For one thing, so far there's been no impact site found, but that doesn't really matter because 350 million years has passed since then, and there wouldn't be that much of a crater with that much time to erode. But the fact is that an asteroid impact would have equal effect on both land and sea, so most people think that it must have been an event that was specific to the oceans. The most popular theory is that something caused the oxygen levels in the oceans to plummet. This would have an adverse effect on many of the different groups that rose to dominance over the 61 million year period. Brachiopods, trilobites, and ammonites would all be hit hard by this, but they would pull through. But the worst effects were to the marine vertebrates. As much as 96% of them were wiped out in the last few million years of the Devonian. The bony and cartilaginous fish managed to hang on, but unfortunately, the armored placoderms were not so lucky. These animals were extremely well adapted to be the kings of the oceans, and they were the first vertebrates to take control away from the inverts. And although their rule was short when you look at the total story of life on Earth, it showed for the first time that the body plan of an internal skeleton is not inherently inferior to an exoskeleton. But once again, it also shows that whenever a catastrophic change in the world takes place, it's the ones on top that have the most to lose. Whenever there's a major ecosystem collapse, the animals at the top of the food chain are normally the ones that are going to struggle the most to get what they need to survive. Whatever the cause of the die-off at the end of the Devonian, our direct ancestors like Tiktaalik were relatively unaffected. In fact, as this period came to a close, they were actually becoming more abundant than ever. And now the land was growing even more hospitable and trees started to spread across the globe and eventually from pole to pole would be covered in an endless tropical forest. And that would be the stage for the next chapter in the Odyssey of Life. I want to thank everyone for watching this video through to the end. This has been one of the most anticipated chapters in the History of the Earth series, and I wanted to make sure that I covered some of the most notable events that took place. This script was actually a doozy, and I had to rewrite it probably three times, which is why it took a little bit longer than usual. So I hope you all enjoyed this look into our world up to 358 million years ago. If you did, 
let me know by giving this video a like. And comment and let me know if there's any specific topics that you would like for me to cover in the future. Many of the videos I've already done have come from direct requests from viewers who have asked a question that caught my interest. And if you enjoyed this series, don't forget to subscribe for more. I don't know how long it's going to take me, but eventually I will see this through to the end. Have a good one, everybody. So I hope that video had helped you better understand how these fishes, some of them have evolved into the first amphibians. The fishes dominated the Devonian period and some of these fishes started developing lobe fins and these lobe fins eventually turned into legs and uh, these creatures they were able to hold themselves out of the water started invading the dry land and they became the first amphibians so the amphibians started colonizing the land and they dominated during the so-called carboniferous period so the carboniferous period can be characterized as follows so we have here the emergence of the first reptiles becoming the first vertebrates to fully live independent of the water again because of the development of the amniotic egg then we have also the amphibians as i mentioned earlier they started diversifying producing creatures more than 20 feet long so we saw here the dominance of the amphibians that's why during the carboniferous period the period is also dubbed as the age of the amphibians also there were primitive conifers scale trees and other seed bearing plants that flourish these resulted from the huge tropical and subtropical forests that covered the massive continent of pangaea so during the carboniferous period we saw the emergence of that supercontinent called pangaea then also we have primitive insects ancient grasshoppers mayflies and roaches were common because of these prehistoric plant life and the carboniferous period is also dubbed as the age of the insects all right so to further help you visualize the major event that occurred during the carboniferous period let's watch this video all right let's watch this Getting back to our journey through time, the state of life at the end of the Devonian was very different depending on where you were standing. If you were one of the pioneers of the land, the world was pretty nice. Forests were spreading out from the rivers and marshes, and there was getting to be more and more opportunity here all the time. But if you lived exclusively in the ocean, well, you're probably lucky to be alive. The world's oceans had been hit by a mass extinction that only left around 4% of the animals that were thriving previously. But the land didn't seem to be having these issues. I say good riddance. Well, that's rude. Everything keeps trying to eat me. You think that's gonna stop just because we're on land? So basically, as we go into the Carboniferous, there was once again a power vacuum in both the marine and terrestrial environments all over the world, for two totally different reasons. In the ocean, life was bouncing back from the death of the armored fish and many other dominant groups. And on land, the spread of the massive global forest would open up new opportunities for those who were able to adapt. This forest would become so all-encompassing that not only would it have a very unique effect on our planet and its inhabitants at this time, but it would even affect our modern world in a critical way. Which is wild to think about considering this period began 358 million years ago. I've been looking forward to this one, so let's dive into the Carboniferous Jungles. During the Carboniferous, the world was undergoing more drastic changes than ever before. Gondwana was slowly drifting northwest on a collision course with Euro-America and Siberia. And the small chain of islands that started to form to the northeast of the supercontinent during the Devonian had grown into a small landmass in its own right. It's impossible to tell from looking at it, but this small island continent will one day make up part of China. 
The formation of this landmass further isolated the Panthalassic and Paleotethys oceans from one another. But the real massive change was when this little blue and brown marble finally started to change into a blue and green marble. Plants, fungi, cyanobacteria, and a few animals had been able to establish themselves on land in some capacity leading up to this time. But generally speaking, the first pioneers were restricted to staying close to the waterways. But this was all about to change. Because in the hot, humid climate of the early Carboniferous, there was about to be an explosion of biodiversity every bit as impressive as the Cambrian or Ordovician explosions that we saw in the oceans of the past. And the first organisms that we see this with would be the plants. Horsetails, club mosses, ferns, primitive conifers, and cycads all get their start here. And that's just the ones that we're familiar with today. This jungle would spread out from the rivers and ocean and cover the entire globe in an endless tree line unlike anything we've seen up until now. And this would have a profound impact on the world in several ways. For one thing, the presence of all this plant life also meant a massive increase in oxygen. And any time that we see big changes in the air, usually that makes for big changes for everything else, as we've seen before. For one thing, it started to change the climate. We start to see a cooling trend by the middle Carboniferous that leads to an ice cap forming at the South Pole for the first time in millions of years. Probably the only part of the land that wasn't covered in vegetation. As this runaway effect continued on, generations of plants would come and go, and old vegetation would fall to the forest floor either just through natural processes or, much more likely, forest fires that would be taking place as an extra consequence of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. And these plants spent their entire lives taking in CO2 and expelling O2, leaving the C, or carbon, locked in their tissues. And over the 60 million years of this period, this would be something that would be locked away in the Earth forever. So slightly off topic, this is something that I hear from people all the time. People who say the use of fossil fuels means that we're using the liquefied fossil remains of dinosaurs are pretty much dead wrong. The overwhelming majority of the fossil fuels in use today originally are dated back to the coal beds of this time, 100 million years before the first dinosaur ever existed. In fact, there's so much carbon in the deposits all over the world from this time that this is the inspiration behind the naming of this entire period, the Carboniferous. Checking back in with the oceans, as I said before, the state that it was kind of left in by the end of the Devonian was pretty sad. But of course, as always, extinctions leave opportunities open for the survivors to expand into new forms. And in the warm waters of the early Carboniferous, there was about to be another mass diversification. Echinoderms, cranoids, gastropods, and bivalves all managed to pull through. And the cephalopods were still hanging on as well, but by now the straight and curved shelled varieties had died out. What was left was the ammonites and the true nautiloids. Which, despite animals like the modern nautilus bearing a resemblance to ammonites, this is how far back the two groups actually separated. The trilobites were still around, but unfortunately, they were definitely on the decline compared to previous periods. They may have been starting to get outcompeted by other forms of arthropods like the true crustaceans. This seems to mark the end of the invertebrates reign as the rulers of the oceans, as the fish, despite losing 96% of their biodiversity by the end of the Devonian, were about to take control for themselves, and this time it would be in a much more familiar form. This was the Chondrichthian's time to rule, the group of fish that, among other things, would lead to the shark. Now this line of fish has been around since all the way back in the Silurian, but they had remained smaller and relied on their cartilage-based skeletons to allow them to be faster and evade the armored monsters that were filling the dominant roles. But now, after the fall of the Eurypterids and Placoderms, it was the perfect moment for them to become the masters of the sea. The Chondrichthians radiated into several different groups. The most successful being a different group from the true sharks called the Eugeniodontids. These creatures had some very interesting face and headgear. 
but otherwise, a lot of them were starting to be very similar to modern sharks. For example, there's the early species called Cassiotis. This was one of the basial members of the group, and although they would survive for quite a long time, it would also give rise to several other noteworthy creatures, like the slightly more unique Ornithoprion, which in itself would be the direct ancestor to probably the most well-known member of this order in the future. The fish quickly bounced back as the Carboniferous went on some groups even managing to spread into freshwater ecosystems, putting them in close proximity of the new world opening up in the air above. And this world would be a world of swamp monsters and giant bugs. As oxygen levels skyrocketed and the land was covered in tropical forests and swamps, the vertebrates and arthropods were about to take their age-old evolutionary arms race to the new frontier. It was at this time that some of our tetrapod ancestors started to become true amphibians, finally developing the fins and fin-like legs into proper weight-bearing limbs. The earliest example of this was with a creature called Peterpees, a name which means Peter's foot. Who's Peter? This one meter long creature is very important because it's currently thought to be the evolutionary link between the tetrapods that were more similar to lobe fin fish and the true amphibians. And also because fossils of land animals from the early Carboniferous are extremely rare. So for all we know, there might have been a ton of other animals like this crawling around. But as time goes on, we do see a lot of other strange types of amphibian in the later stages. Some of them even have had their shiny new legs shrink and become more snake-like. Like this thing called Colorado Erpatin. And then some went in the opposite direction and further developed their limbs for walking on land. Like Tutty Tanis. And we even have some major predators coming from this group like Anthracosaurus. Measuring up to three meters long and is also known as the reptile-like amphibians. But the most dominant of all was a group of ruling amphibians called the Temnospondyls. Large species like Eriops may have grown up to 3 meters long and 200 kilograms, probably hunting somewhat similar to, once again, crocodilians. These were some of the most powerful vertebrates on the land. But unfortunately, not only did our arthropod competitors have a head start colonizing the land, but the way that they were designed was going to give them an edge in this high oxygen environment. You see, unlike terrestrial vertebrates which have two lungs and breathe through their nose and throat, terrestrial arthropods have openings across their bodies that connect to the tissues that need oxygen. That's why today there's an upper limit to the maximum size that arthropods can reach. Because in today's atmospheric oxygen level of 21%, bugs can't grow to 3-4 meters long. But if you crank the oxygen up to, say, 35%, as it was in the Carboniferous, suddenly the limit has been raised. In these jungles, there were giant bugs. Like the terrifying 70 centimeter long Pulmona scorpius. Yes, this was a scorpion the length of a human arm. The largest any terrestrial arachnid would ever grow. And we also see the largest land invertebrate to ever exist, the herbivorous Arthropleura, a millipede that could grow up to two and a half meters long. And the bugs would even take to the skies for the first time during this period, most well known of which being the falcon-sized Meganeura, a relative of modern dragonflies and damselflies. And among all these monsters in the tropical landscape of the Carboniferous, there was even a relic of a bygone time lurking in the swamps. The one and a half meter long Campiocephalus, the very last of the sea scorpions. Despite this guy's pedigree for predation, the Eurypterid's days were long past them at this point. Basically nothing more than an oversized horseshoe crab, probably using its shovel-shaped body to push through the muck and scavenging on whatever it could. A humble end to what was once the top predator of the oceans. With all these strange creatures around, the Carboniferous Swamps was likely a very dangerous place for many of the smaller vertebrates running around. Our direct tetrapod ancestors were constantly having to hide from giant carnivorous amphibians and bugs. Going into the late Carboniferous, there was a major change on the horizon for our ancestors. You see, despite the fact that the forests were spreading far inland from the rivers and swamps, we were not able to do the same. 
This is because the early tetrapods were still dependent on the water. We could breathe air, but our skin was not capable of holding water. So if we spent too much time on dry land, we ran the risk of drying out. And our eggs were still completely dependent on the water. So for a while, we were kind of stuck. But these were all issues that we were going to overcome around 320 million years ago. As some of the amphibious tetrapods became the very first amniotes, their thicker skin would protect them from drying out. And now their eggs would have a hard membrane or shell that would make them less physically fragile as well as allow them to be laid outside of the water. We were now truly all-terrain organisms. And with these new adaptations, the amniotes spread across the world, diversifying into two major clades, the sauropsids and the synapsids. Despite these early members of this order looking very similar to each other, inside there were differences that would be the first signs of things that would become defining features of the two clades. These can best be seen in the skulls and teeth. While the skulls of sauropsids had two openings besides the eye socket, synapsids only had one. The earliest known sauropsid was a tiny lizard-like animal called Cassinuria. This was the earliest animal to have claws on its fingers. Yet another adaptation that would be massively useful for future generations. And despite it looking very lizard-like, these guys actually are not true lizards. Actual lizards wouldn't evolve for several million years. And the earliest of the synapsids would be my new form, Archaeothris, who, again, looks like a tiny lizard, but was actually more advanced than the early sauropsids. It had stronger jaws than most animals at the time for this size, and actually had a pronounced canine tooth. That was another thing that started to separate the sauropsids from the synapsids, is that the synapsids tended to have different kinds of teeth in their mouth, at least much more pronounced differences than what we saw in the sauropsids. Now, despite all the amniotes looking pretty similar early on, they would explode over the next 20 million years, and once again be able to fight back against the giant bugs and the amphibians hiding in the swamp. And they would get larger too, with herbivores like Desmatodon and carnivores like Limnoskylus. Despite this period often being referred to as either the Age of Amphibians or the Age of Giant Bugs, depending on which side you're on, I guess. By the end of the period, the amniotes were making a decent case for themselves as they managed to go anywhere that they wanted to. And it was a good thing that they did, too, because as Gondwana and Euramerica came together, there was going to be a lot of changes that will spell the end of the global rainforest. As more and more CO2 was absorbed by the global rainforest, this steadily continued to have an effect on the climate as well. Through most of the Carboniferous, things remained pretty warm and humid, just the way the amphibians like it. And the oxygen levels kept getting higher, just the way the giant bugs liked it. The problem was that this was creating a cycle that inevitably could not sustain itself. Because CO2 is also a greenhouse gas needed to keep the warm temperatures up. So the more carbon got locked in cold deposits, it did start to get cooler. The glaciers over the South Pole started to expand. This dropped the sea level and made the climate drier. And then, as things were already starting to get dicey, Gondwana, Siberia, and Euroamerica would finally come together to form the massive supercontinent known as Pangaea. And this would be the tipping point. As the world continued to get cooler and drier, suddenly it became much more difficult for rain clouds to carry water from the ocean to the interior of the continent. And without rain, there can be no rainforests. This is known as the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. And this would be the event that brings this period to an end. As the southern region became locked in ice, the swamps and rainforests started to disappear. This would spell the end for many of the dominant amphibians. And another consequence would be that the oxygen levels would no longer be able to hold at such a high percentage. So, although insects as a whole would be fine, this would also be the end of the giant bugs. A few Temdospondyls would manage to hang on in the coastal areas near the equator. But, ironically, our ancestors were doing quite okay. And now, in this new dry world, the amniotes were going to take over. Especially the synapsids. Ah, Tim Tim. I see you followed me down the path of the stem mammal. Is the coast clear? Yep. 
Most of the bugs and the swamp monsters are all dead. Timtim here has evolved into another synapsid called Aerosaurus. And I can't help but notice that you've picked a form that's particularly good at running. That's right, and I now have very well adapted teeth for hunting. So now I'll be the predator. Things are starting to look up for us for sure. Despite all that we've seen up until now, somehow we've managed to not only survive, but come out on top. And with all that carbon safely locked away underground, the climate will remain nice and cool. After all, it's not like some inquisitive little monkey is going to come along and start burning it as fuel and releasing all those greenhouse gases into the air. Because that would be insane. Alright, so I hope that video by David Attenborough gave us a visual understanding of how the fishes, some of them evolved into the first amphibians. And these amphibians, together with the insects, they dominated the Carboniferous period. Now also we have to take note that during the Carboniferous period, we have an abundance of vegetation. And uh, as these vegetations die, they become buried in sediments and because of pressure and heat, the remains of the plant life or vegetation turned into coal, oil, and natural gas. That's why it's called the Carboniferous period. Alright, so before we end with this video about the Paleozoic era, let's mention the last period of this era called the Permian period. Now, the Permian period can be characterized as follows. So first, we have the appearance of reptiles such as the Dimetrodon and many others begin to dominate and eventually replace the amphibians. Fish and amphibians are still plentiful during the Permian period. Insects, they also diversified. And many plant and animal groups, reptiles like therapsid, ancestors to mammals evolved and also there was a mass extinction event during the permian period uh, this occurred killing 90 to 96 percent of all species mammal-like reptiles survived eventually to evolve into true mammals during the permian period the permian period is also known as the great dying so here is an illustration of the dimetrodon that dominated the Permian period and there was again this mass extinction killing 95% of life on earth that's why the Permian period is also known as the great dying so before we end with this video about the Paleozoic era let's watch this video about the great dying or the Permian period let's watch this <laughs> For most of Earth's 4.5 billion year history, the only living things were microscopic single-celled organisms. But once the Paleozoic era began about half a billion years ago, there was an explosion of complex life in the oceans, and over the next several hundred million years, life started to slowly colonize the land. But these assemblages of life were still mostly relegated to the edges of the water. But by the time the Permian had begun, the last pieces of the puzzle had fallen into place. Fully terrestrial, water-independent land ecosystems. These ecosystems would continue to grow until they faced an extinction larger than any in the history of complex life. The Permian period is the sixth and final period of the Paleozoic era, lasting from 299 to 252 million years ago. At this time, the Earth's land masses are mostly clumped together into the supercontinent of Pangaea, although Siberia and several large islands remain independent. At the beginning of the Permian, the Ice Age that began in the later Carboniferous is still ongoing, and the South Pole is still covered by a massive ice sheet. Unsurprisingly, conditions at this point in prehistory are much colder than usual, similar to today's climate, but that's where the similarities end. Because of the recent proliferation of land plants across the continents during the Carboniferous, the atmospheric oxygen levels are at their highest ever point in the Earth's history, at about 35% of the atmosphere, compared to today's 21%. And although the Earth's spin had slowed down significantly since the beginning of the Paleozoic, the days are still under 23 hours long, while sea levels are 200 feet higher than today's. 
The interiors of Pangaea are filled with dry areas, but the wetter areas still harbor swamps that are a lot like those of the Carboniferous. Because of the high levels of oxygen, giant insects and other arthropods are still flourishing, although most insects from this time are ancient relatives of the Polyneopterans. Among the vertebrates, there are still many primitive amphibian-like tetrapods, but now they have been joined by more advanced species that can lay eggs on land. There were forests of early seed-bearing plants, which could also reproduce without as much need for water. These adaptations would come in handy for later, because these colder, wetter conditions would not last long. The Permian is divided into three epochs, the Ciceralian, Guadalupian, and Lopingian. Each of these is divided into stages, and as the Permian goes through these stages, the climate becomes much warmer and drier. The forests of lycopods and other primitive plants would continue to disappear, and the oxygen levels would drop, meaning no more giant arthropods. Among the insects, endoterigotes, which are the ones that undergo four-step metamorphosis, would become more common. Seed plants would also do much better in these situations than their competitors, and it's during the Permian that we see early conifers and cycads proliferate. Land ecosystems would become dominated by large carnivorous and herbivorous amniotes. Despite their outward appearance, these creatures weren't reptiles per se, but were primitive relatives of a very different branch of the vertebrate family tree. Meanwhile, the ancestors of dinosaurs and other reptiles would diversify, with some of them becoming aquatic, joining marine communities full of strange Paleozoic sea life. The Permian Seas contained reefs populated by a menagerie of ancient mollusks and arthropods, as well as sharks, giant sea-going proto-amphibians, and more modern fish than previous periods. But the sea level itself would fall, and end up dropping from 200 feet to only 60 feet above modern levels due to the ocean floor deepening. Increased volcanic activity would keep releasing greenhouse gases, raising the temperature higher and higher, and turning most of Pangaea into a desert. Eventually, these factors would lead to the largest mass extinction of multicellular organisms of all time. But during these 47 million years, the groundwork was being laid for the future of life on Earth, and the period represents a culmination of 290 million years of Paleozoic evolution.